there are, of course, many people who, who are now coming into the arena of, of the science of consciousness with, with theories ranging from computer models to quantum physics. Let's focus in a little bit more on the neuron. It, it seems to me that uh, the fundamental philosophical question would be, even if we talk about billions of, of neurons or, or many neurons interacting together, how is some kind of a physical system like that going to generate uh, my experience of you sitting across uh, from, from me at this moment? Well, your experience of me has, has an, a number of different aspects. Mm -hmm. One is that you're taking in information from your, with your eyes and your ears and so on. You're taking in a lot of information so that your brain is really a machine which is processing information. So it isn't too surprising that neurons can do that. After all, com chips in computers process information. There is a much more difficult problem of what philosophers call qualia, the redness of red and the mm -hmm. painfulness of pain. Mm -hmm. But I think one should regard these as two aspects of, of, of the problem we're trying to solve. Right. Uh, in, in other words, on the one hand, if, if I were a computer, I might know that there is another machine in, in, in front. I might be able to register that there is another machine in front of me without actually seeing the way a human being sees. Well, that's true, but I wanted to say a little mm -hmm. more than that. Yes. I wanted to say that the actual mechanisms, which are probably not the ones we have in computers, because mm -hmm. there's a lot going on at once, and yes. you unify it in mm -hmm. some sort of way, that's probably what makes you conscious. But if you want to convey to me mm -hmm. what red looks to you, You've got to translate that yes. into several stages, into language and then into movements, even if you just point. Mm -hmm. And you've got to recode it. And that recoding is a personal property, probably. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can't convey to me the exact redness of red. And therefore, it's difficult to do a scientific work on that aspect mm -hmm. of it. But to know which part of your brain is signaling which is red and what makes you aware of what is red, because you can have the what you might call red neurons going on in your brain mm -hmm. even when you're in a deep sleep, mm -hmm. you see. It's not just because there's some activity. Mm -hmm. There has to be some special activity, and that's mm -hmm. what we want to find out. You seem to be saying that when it comes to my experience, there's going to be a level which is so unique to me that it's, it's beyond the scope of science, but there, that science can still uh, explore quite a bit about human consciousness and experience. Yes, but it's very rash to say that things are beyond the scope of science, because uh -huh. it could be argued that in some period, uh, along in, in the, sometime in the future, yeah. it would be possible to connect in some fine detail your brain to my brain, so that I could experience the way you are seeing red. Now, nobody knows what we need to have to need to do to do that. Yes. And we know virtually certainly we can't see how to do it at the moment. Mm -hmm. And maybe it will always be impossible. Mm -hmm. But it'd be rash to say it could never be done. It's certainly an idea that's been in science fiction for a long that's time. That's right. But they always think it's just easy. You just take a few hours and plug <laughs> it in. It's certainly going to be more difficult than that. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps I might ask you bluntly, what is your assessment of the state of neuroscience at, at, at this point in time? Well, I think one has to say two things. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience has developed remarkably in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, you can see this for no other reason than the increase in the numbers of neuroscientists. When you, they have a, uh, their annual meeting, I think the last meeting there were 23,000 of them, something like that. When they started, there was only 1,000. Mm -hmm. So the, the inc there's a large num increase in people working on it. There's a very considerable increase in our knowledge, which is why we can start thinking about experiments and ideas. But when you look how far you've got to go to explain this very complicated thing, which is our brain and all the processes which are very transient and interacting mm -hmm. in, in, in very intricate ways, uh, we're clearly only just beginning. Yes. But nevertheless, we have made a solid beginning, but only a beginning. Mm -hmm. You seem to like the idea of reverberating neural circuits uh, as a basis for, uh, for mental experience, for mental images or consciousness. Well, that's not, of course, my idea. It's a, 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 the Canadian psychologist Hebb mm -hmm. uh, put it forward, and I, others may have done Donald it before. Donald Hebb. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, we think that we should look out for that. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily believe it has to be that form. And it's, um, 
it's not at all clear which circuits would reverberate because things are so interconnected in the brain that to get a reverberation which doesn't spread all over the place is not easy. And if you do get a reverberation which spreads all over the place, you have epilepsy, uh -huh. <laughs> you see. So, so it, it's one of our speculative ideas, uh -huh. but not something which we, we feel uh, deeply about, shall yeah. we say. Oh, okay, but when we talk, uh, talk about visual processing in particular, which is an area that you've specialized in, uh, you seem to favor uh, the idea of a, a reverberating circuit between the cortex on the surface of the brain and, and a deeper area called the thalamus. Yes, that's perfectly true. But what we want to explain is the fact that, it's, that you have to have some form of very short-term memory. Mm -hmm. If you couldn't remember at all what had immediately happened, it's difficult to see how you could be aware of anything. So there has to be some form of very short-term memory, but it could take other forms. That's just one of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly most unclear which circuits. We suggest that circuit for certain technical reasons, but that, uh, most of the experiments that have been done, it, done on it have been done under animals under an anesthetic. Yes. So it isn't too surprising we haven't seen the, the actual reverberation. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed that when you uh, answer my questions, as you wrote in, in your book, the, the astonishing hypothesis, every answer needs to be qualified. The, the field of neuroscience is so complex that, that it seems as, as if there is no way to state a, a simple and obvious theory about any of it. Well, so it would be if you talked about genes. Uh -huh. If you talked about genes and what they are. In fact, if you ask anybody in the field to define a gene, they have great difficulty finding a definition. And that's because basically we believe it's all evolved by natural selection. And it's a lot of gadget, molecular gadgetry and, and so on. And you don't expect to be a, a simple, crisp answer as you get, say, in Newtonian mechanics. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a different, biology is very different from physics in that respect, yes. at least from fundamental mm -hmm. physics. Well, I'm puzzled a little bit because since, since the field is so complex and amorphous and ambiguous and no one theory uh, seems to exist with, without many objections popping up along the way, why do you hold uh, that neurons are so primary? Well, it's difficult to see unless you want to go to something uh, um, which um, is immaterial. Mm. It's difficult to see. And we wouldn't want to say that the certain of the molecules associated with neurons or even what's called the glial cells. The point about neurons is that they're very good at sending information over long distances or you couldn't waggle your toes, mm -hmm. for example. So yes. that's why we concentrate on neurons. It's just a, a natural place to, to focus. But it doesn't mean to say we don't look at groups of neurons and, or, nor the, and, or we also look at the components of neurons and the things affiliated with neurons. Mm -hmm. It's just a focus, focus at Mm -hmm. Well, one of the big philosophical arguments in the, f in the field of consciousness is, is the mind-brain mm -hmm. problem. And, and you're suggesting that, that if we look at neurons, that, that will be the way to resolve that problem. Another major philosophical controversy has been the question of free will. And, and you seem to have a unique approach to that question as well. Well, I'm not sure it's unique. Mm -hmm. um, there is a postscript to the book which is written in a rather light-hearted manner. Uh, because a friend of mine, in, uh, a scientist in South America, wrote to me about free will. And uh, I could see that his ideas were very different from mine. I didn't know I had any ideas about free will. Mm -hmm. So I then wrote them down what they were in a sketch way. But the point of that postscript really is to say, it does suggest a, a sketch of an idea about free will. But the, the real point of that is to say that it, any explanation probably depends on the distinction between the conscious processes in your brain and the unconscious ones, and it would be wise to understand that first before you got too deeply into free will. Mm -hmm. I mean, you must have noticed that, uh, for example, among your friends, that they sometimes don't always give the reasons for what they're doing, that yes. they think it is quite genuinely. Mm -hmm. And you can sometimes predict what they're going to do before they actually do it, Yes, you see. So mm -hmm. you have to incorporate all that, and that's because uh, what comes out as free will has got a lot of unconscious processing going on before that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to make that distinction, it probably won't be easy to explore free will scientifically. Mm -hmm.